Hi, I'm Sarah Gardner. Do you like potatoes? French fried, mashed, or baked, potatoes are perhaps America's favorite vegetable. Well, stick around because we're serving up the spuds on this edition of America's Heartland. We'll take you to Colorado where potato farmers are meeting consumer demands with some fast and furious work in the fields. Idaho is famous for its potatoes. Are you ready for some new varieties to grace your dinner table? We'll travel to Arkansas, where sweet potatoes are the pick of the crop for one farm family. And Sharon Profis is in the kitchen with a farm to fork potato recipe you'll want to try at home. It's all coming up on America's Heartland. America's Heartland is made possible by Crop Life America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KVIE to support America's heartland programming. Contributors include the following. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man in America's heartland, living close to the land. There's a love for the country and a pride in the brand. In heartland living close close to the land glad you could join us for this edition of America's Heartland when you plan a family dinner our Potatoes on the menu? They are in most American homes. That's because the lowly potato is so versatile and can be prepared in so many ways. And when you head to a restaurant, chefs have lots of options to offer diners. And potatoes are a mainstay in many cultures. You'll find potato dumplings in Slovakia, bangers and mash in England, potato soup or vichyssoise in France, shepherd's pie in Ireland, gnocchi in Italy, and potato pancakes or latkes in Eastern Europe. And regardless of where you live, French fries are sure to be one of the choices when it comes to potatoes. Potatoes are also gluten-free, which makes them popular for those with that dietary concern. So let's start off with a story on getting the starchy tubers to your dinner plate. Akiba Howard heads for the harvest in Colorado. Come late September, potato farmers take to these Colorado fields in a race against the weather. You have to be done by the first part of October because then you usually have a killing freeze and when the frost comes in, it will freeze the potatoes in the ground and then they're not really consumable. Colorado San Luis Valley is well known for growing barley used in some famous name beers and for potatoes that make their way to supermarkets and onto dinner plates. The average person consumes more than 100 pounds of potatoes each year. This is 60 acres and we can probably have it finished harvesting by approximately eight hours. Smoke and Spuds potatoes oversee some 3,500 acres that are planted in May and harvested during a three-week window in early autumn. Field machines drag a chain 12 to 14 inches below the soil surface, unearthing potatoes, which are then scooped up and loaded onto trucks for the first step in packing. Right now we're harvesting Yukon Gold. We are actually taking 12 rows at a time. Valley farmers harvest some 140 million pounds of potatoes. Some make their way to this large processing plant where they're washed, cooled, stored, and separated. We raise several different varieties. We have a russet variety. We also raise yellow flesh potatoes, and we also raise uh, a lot of red yellow flesh potatoes. What's the difference between them? The difference is the russet is your more oblong potato and your the yellow flesh are like the Yukon Gold, they're round and they're yellow inside. And we have the red, yellow flesh, which is red on the outside and yellow on the inside. The workers here separate spuds by size and quality. Some fail to make the cut. Their process is to take out what we call a cull. That's what you're not able to eat, that can be rotten or they're misshaped. Those potatoes are sent to either processing plants or for cattle feed. Big shipments leave by truck or train. Each of these rail cars on the San Luis and Rio Grande Railroad will carry 130,000 pounds of potatoes destined for large-scale packers and commercial accounts. A good-looking potato should, uh, should be uniform in size, depending on what you want. 
Jimmy Luna directs retail packing operations for Mountain King potatoes in Monte Vista, Colorado. Potatoes leave the field. Uh, we load them up on bobtail trucks or indoor semis, bring them into our storage facility here. One particular on potatoes. Depending on when they're harvested, packing and shipping may be delayed till the spuds are cooled to just the right temperature. We start bringing those potatoes down about a degree and a half a week to where we can get them down to 40 degrees. And once you get them to 40 degrees, they go into dormancy. That allows them to be stored longer. Once at an optimum temperature, they come up over the packing line, and that's where we will wash them two, three times, bring them over the packing line, put them into packages, and uh, get them ready out for consumers. The packing plants here can turn out thousands of sacks each day, and potatoes remain one of the most important non-cereal crops in the heartland. The export market for U.S. potatoes totals more than a billion dollars a year. Not bad for a lowly tuber that ends up mashed, baked, or fried. It's pretty amazing the, the, the feedback I get from friends, family, uh, that have no idea where a potato comes from. All they, you know, they, they just eat them. So when I give a tour through here, it's like I had no, no idea so much work was involved to put a potato in a bag to get it to the consumers. Potatoes are definitely a new world food, first thought to have been cultivated in South America between 4,000 and 7,000 years ago. There are more than a hundred varieties of potatoes worldwide. And did we mention spuds in space? Potatoes were grown on board the space shuttle Columbia in 1995. With all those potato varieties to choose from, what determines what you'll find in the supermarket produce section? Well, like everything else, consumers are always looking for something new and different. This means that growers not only have to turn out quantity, Rob Stewart says that quality and new choices are also part of the potato game. This may look like a pile of potatoes at your favorite grocery store, but these are fresh from the field. It's potato harvest time in Idaho. Talk about fresh from the earth. These potatoes have been out of the ground for just five minutes. Can you even begin to imagine how many potatoes are in this field? A lot. <laughs> enough to feed a lot of people. This is Patandon Produce in Idaho Falls, pulling up potatoes from 60 miles of farm fields. Patandon advertises themselves as the largest marketer of fresh potatoes in North America. I wanna see exactly what's under here and show people exactly where these potatoes come from. Look, they just start popping right out. Today's harvest is for miniature varieties of white and red potatoes. And harvest means digging, deadlines, and delivery. Oh, and I want to show you the next part of the harvest. They come in by truckload, go up this conveyor belt, and inside of this potato cellar, which will hold 50,000 bags that are 100 pounds each filled with potatoes. And you can't talk taters without the region's famous russet variety and the hottest sellers for baked potatoes. And as famous as these buds are, newer varieties are breaking new ground. Are there new ones on the horizon? Many, thousands of new varieties My goodness. You know, worldwide. It's a matter of picking the, the best ones though to take to consumers. If you take this potato here and you cut this open. Look how yellow. One of those newer varieties Patandon is producing is the Klondike Rose. Their slogan, red skin with a heart of gold. Sure. I ate it right out of the ground. I did not know that potatoes were good raw like this. Excellent. Actually, with some of the new types, uh, particularly smaller, I think we're, not, we're missing the application of potatoes as raw as something raw that could go in a salad. I see that literally right out of the ground. So why Idaho? It's the volcanic soil, cool nights, and hot days. And potato growers here say there's another winning combination. 
I don't think people realize it, but potatoes are probably one of one or two things that, that a human being can actually survive on. It has the water, the fiber, the nutrients, the vitamins, everything, and it's, low, and it's very low calorie. We ought to be able to tell, tell the world again that potatoes are the health food. We love our potatoes. And what about calories? Well, a baked potato has about 110 calories, but adding butter, cheese, and sour cream can more than triple that number. Hi, I'm Paul Robbins, and here's something you may not have known about agriculture. You like potatoes? Folks in South America first cultivated the spuds some 7,000 years ago. I like them baked, I like them mashed, and I love these guys, potato chips. And I'm not alone, chips have become one of the world's best known snack foods, thanks to a guy named Crumb. Back in 1853, George Crum was working as a chef at an elegant resort in Saratoga Springs, New York. French fries were on the menu, but one guest found Crum's French fries to be too thick. Uh, one aside here, by the way, Thomas Jefferson is credited with introducing French fries to America in the 18th century. But back to our story. Crum was irritated by the guest and decided to cut the fries really, really thin. That'll show them. Well, it, it all backfired. The guests loved the fries and potato chips were born. But before chips could spread to England and the rest of the US, two things happened. The automatic potato peeler was invented in the 1920s and a Tennessee man named Herman Lay started selling chips. His cross-country travels made Lay's the first successful national brand. Today, the chips are a big boon to potato farmers whose spuds become these tasty snacks. Flavors? Well, you're familiar with barbecue chips and salt and vinegar, but if you travel overseas, you can find your chips in fruit chutney flavor, beef jerky, or soy sauce and butter. I mentioned that you have a lot of choices when it comes to finding the perfect potato recipe to serve your family or friends, but it's always nice to get some suggestions on a new recipe that just might wow the crowd. Well, Sharon Profis is in the kitchen and has a farm to fork idea you'll want to try at home. Potatoes are such a staple everywhere you go. Not only are they really affordable, but they also take well to transformation. So today we're making potato and zucchini waffles with lots of herbs topped with some of my favorite breakfast items. To get started, we'll first chop up all of our herbs. I've got basil, flat leaf parsley, and chives. Potatoes are really great because they'll take on just about any flavor you give them. So a variety of herbs will work here, but so will a variety of toppings. Now the idea behind this dish really comes from potato pancakes. In my family, they come around during Hanukkah and we call them latkes. But the downside about potato pancakes is that you have to fry them and use a lot of oil. So they're not really the healthiest thing to have in the morning. So by using a waffle iron, not only are we cutting out a lot of that oil, but we're giving it a new presentation because anything in waffle form is amazing. So we have our parsley and our basil, and now we'll add in chives. And I love chives because they give you a really delicate, oniony flavor without totally hitting you over the head with it. And we'll put all of those herbs into our bowl. There are over 100 varieties of potatoes, and each one of those fits into seven types. You have red, yellow, blue, white, fingerling, russet, and petite. In this case, we're using russet potatoes. The reason that I'm using it today is because it's really starchy, and it'll take on the flour and the eggs that'll hold the waffle together. So first, we'll peel the skin, and in certain scenarios, it's completely okay to leave the skin on. Just make sure you give it a good scrub. The skin is full of fiber, and it's great if you're just doing oven-baked fries. But for the waffles, we'll peel the potato. When you're choosing your potato, there are a couple things you want to look for. 
First, you want to make sure that it's really firm. Any soft spots means that it's probably no good anymore. Avoid any bruising or any deep cuts. Avoid those and you'll have great potatoes. So we're just gonna grate one potato. That's more than enough for two to four waffles, depending on how large your iron is. Let's add our second two main ingredients, zucchini and onion. So for the zucchini and the onion, we'll do the same thing. Just grate it and combine it with the potato. The key to really crispy potato waffles or even potato pancakes is to make sure you get out as much water as possible. Otherwise, you just end up with a really soggy mess. So in order to do this, all you need is a clean dish towel and a colander. You can also use a cheesecloth here, but a dish towel is just fine. And we'll take all of our ingredients and put it in the dish towel. Now you have to use a little muscle. So gather the edges and just start wringing it out. And you can see just how much water is packed in those vegetables. So just keep wringing out and when you think you're done, keep wringing because you're not. The drier you can get them, the crispier your waffles will be. All right, one last squeeze. And now they should be pretty dry. So we'll set that aside. And we'll let our veggies join all of our herbs. Well, most of the water is gone. We'll just add a few other ingredients that are really typical of waffles anyway. So we have two eggs. And if you're making this recipe for a bigger crowd, a nice rule of thumb is one egg for every vegetable. Or if you're just doing it with potatoes, one egg for every potato. Same thing, one tablespoon of flour for every egg. So just a couple tablespoons of flour there. That'll help bind it all together. Plenty of salt to bring out the flavor. Salt and potatoes are just a classic combination. When have you had french fries without plenty of salt on them, right? So now we'll just add some pepper and we'll start heating up our iron. This is a beautiful dish. It comes out so colorful and it's a perfect base for whatever you want to put on top. The more you let this sit, the more water is going to come out. So you want to work pretty quickly and get these on the waffle iron as soon as you can. Our waffle iron is hot. I've got it on medium heat because these waffles do take a little bit longer. We want the potatoes to cook through. So they'll be in there for about 10 minutes. But before they go in, we'll give them a quick spray with cooking spray to make sure they don't stick. And then we'll just put them right in there. It's good. While our waffles are cooking, let's go ahead and prep the rest of our ingredients. For the topping, we'll keep it pretty basic. I have some fresh baby arugula here that I'll dress with a little lemon, some olive oil, and a little salt and pepper. The arugula is gonna be great because it adds a little bit of a peppery flavor, where the zucchini adds sweetness, plus it'll add a little brightness to the dish. Now, the second two ingredients for the toppings are sour cream, which is classic on potato pancakes, and smoked salmon. So we'll just get a few pieces here. This is a really classic combination that'll go well over our waffles, which should be done. If they're done, they'll be crispy on top, which they are, and they should leave the waffle iron pretty easily. Look at how beautiful they are. And you wanna serve these right away, but if you can't, if you wanna make more, all you have to do is set your oven to 200 degrees and put them directly on the oven rack to keep them warm and crispy. So, all that's left is to top them. There are so many ways you can use potatoes, but here we've highlighted them in a new take on the traditional potato pancake. Bon appetit. Let's sweeten the deal on potatoes for just a moment. So far, we've been talking about baked, mashed, or French fried white potatoes. But let's not forget sweet potatoes. Nutritionists tout their healthy qualities, and they've long been a favorite around the holidays. George Washington grew sweet potatoes on his farm in Virginia. Our Yolanda Vasquez says the Matthews family may not go back quite that far, but sweet potatoes are an important part of their history. <laughs> 
What's it like trying to process and pack close to a third of a million pounds of sweet potatoes a week? At Matthews Ridgeview Farms, it means a well-choreographed grading line of workers hand-picking the most perfect-looking potatoes. They want that slick, pretty sweet potato. They don't want one crooked and beat up, skint, scarred. So we do the best we can. Terrace Matthews directs operations here at their packing plant and out in the field, an operation that's become the largest grower-producer of sweet potatoes in Arkansas. We're distributing and packing, uh, oh, probably seven, eight loads a week, maybe 10 on some weeks. Sweet potatoes have been a part of the Matthews family history for over 100 years. Terrace remembers playing in the fields when he was just a youngster. Mom always helped in the family. It's always been a family farm operation. And I remember somebody asked me, how old are you? I'd do this here, I'd say four. And so I'd always go to the field with mother because my brother and sister were in school. Terrace's dad and uncle marketed their homegrown sweet potatoes locally, but after a while, Terrace and his wife, Kim, decided to branch off on their own. I could see a big vision, and I was putting a lot of effort into it, and which I, everybody worked, don't get me wrong there. I was looking for more growth. I could see growth. But growing the business also meant turning this old building into a modern sweet potato packing plant. I built a whole new packing line. I went stainless steel, you know, food safety. Uh, I was thinking ahead on that. After seven months, Matthews had created about 20,000 square feet of cooler storage, enough room to house a large inventory of tightly packed cases of prime potatoes. Probably have about 50,000 cases left now. And they'll be packed up and loaded onto a truck in no time if Kim has her way. And then I've got one going to Chicago. Terrace's wife handles the marketing of their sweet potatoes to major retailers and vendors throughout the country. I knew that when we expanded and moved into this facility that I was going to be a big part of the business. Miss Kim, I help you. So you're going to put the 160. In. Kim's earlier work for a food service company gave her the background to grow the business. One part of their sales plan focuses on an international food safety program called Global Gap. I just thought, you know, we need to do this. We're not, they're not making us do it now, but that's coming. So I started visiting with my husband about it, and we got in touch with some people, some consultants that help you get ready for the Global Gap. The international certification opened world markets to them, attracting major buyers from the United Kingdom and Canada. They even added new labels in French. We can assure our customer or a potential new customer that they're going to have a safe product coming from us. Being able to track where their sweet potatoes come from certainly gives the Matthews a competitive edge, but they insist it's the quality of their product that separates them from the pack. Right now, there are about a dozen men picking and grading sweet potatoes, but you'll notice Terrace is the last man on the line. Now, normally there are more important things for a big boss to do, but he likes to take a final look at his product to make sure it meets the quality standards his customers have come to expect. Well, you always want that quality. You know, quality has always been our bottom line. You, you send a good potato, you get a good response, you get repeat business. Terrace also credits the increased sales of sweet potatoes to their nutritional value. The starchy, sweet-tasting root vegetable is rich in complex carbohydrates, fiber, beta-carotene, and vitamin C. The sweet potato market is growing a lot right now. It's nutritious and delicious, that's what I'd say. It's a very healthy vegetable, and more people are seeing that every day. As Kim and Terrace work together to build their business, their efforts have added another generation to the family's agricultural endeavors. Terrace's mom can often be found working in the office, his dad David on the grading line. My dad was always my best friend. I mean, we'd always hung around together. He guided me in the right direction all the time. And the latest generation of the Matthews family has even become the face of the family product. That's because the smiling faces of Jay Lee and Tacey Matthews can be found on the cover of each potato packing box. It's turned into a really good marketing tool because so many retailers are pushing the family theme. And we're not just trying to sell this as a marketing aspect. They really are the fifth generation. And Terrace and Kim hope the girls will someday take over the family business, keeping the Matthews sweet potato legacy alive. Now that we've made you spud savvy, don't forget that we have recipes from today's show and lots more at our website. That's americasheartland.org. 
And remember that you can connect to us through some of your favorite social media sites as well. There's lots to enjoy online. Meantime, thanks for being with us. We'll look for you next time on America's Heartland. You can purchase a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this program. Here's the cost. To order, just visit us online or call 888-814-3923. You can see it in the eyes of every woman and man In America's heartland Living close to the land There's a love for the country And a pride in the brand In America's heartland Living close Close to the land America's Heartland is made possible by CropLife America, representing the companies whose modern farming innovations help America's farmers provide nutritious food for communities around the globe. The Fund for Agriculture Education, a fund created by KVIE to support America's Heartland programming. Contributors include the following.